Today I'm joined by Matt Langridge. Matt is quadruple Olympian, bronze medalist at the 2012 Olympic Games, silver medalist at the 2008 Olympic Games, and Olympic gold medalist at the 2016 Olympic Games in the men's rowing eight. Further achievements, three times world champion, and a lot of other medals at world championships. Welcome, Matt. Hello. Hi, how are you? I'm fine. Matt, something that interests me, your event, the Men's Rowing Aid, seems to be a very competitive event. I looked at the history. In the last 40 years, there has never been a nation winning it back-to-back -back at the Olympics. Why is that? Um, I think with the eight, it's, it's, um, it's obviously the fastest boat. Uh, it's the, it's in rowing, it's seen as the Blue Room event. So it's kind of the, uh, the version, our version of the 100 meters. Um, and I think because of the dynamics of it, because naturally, because it is a, it's a, uh, it tends to be a much closer race. So um, the winner doesn't tend to uh, win it by a big distance. It can, um, I mean, we actually win it by a reasonable distance in Rio, but tend, it can be quite, quite a close event. Uh, but I think also having a team of eight people, nine people, if you include the Cox, is it's, it's difficult both to get right. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's difficult to kind of win consistently year on year. And um, I think, uh, it, yeah, it just has different dynamics. And I think maybe in the smaller boats where you have one or two people, you can have them being the top guys uh, consistently. But when you have a team event like the eight, it's much harder to get, to get, uh, to, to keep that momentum going within the team. There's so many different variables that can happen. Yeah. Um, it's more manageable when it's a smaller crew. Okay. And then, for example, what's different to the Coxless 4, where Team GB has won, I think, the last five Olympic Games? Uh, I think, obviously, it's a smaller boat category. Um, the, I think with the eight, obviously, um, it's probably more competitive in terms of the fact that a lot of the big nations uh, target it more. Um, so, obviously, uh, it's a oh. big thing for the Americans, the Germans, obviously yeah. yours, um, New Zealand. All the big nations will target the eight and try and try and win the eight uh, in the four uh, that sometimes happens but it doesn't always it tends to be more us and the the australians who tend to really target that event as their main as their main boat class uh, which obviously makes it slightly easier to to keep um to win multiple times but i think also in the four because it's a much smaller boat class uh, you can have the same guys winning in the four because they're a much bigger part of the crew Mm -hmm. So, um, for instance, we had in, um, in Sydney in um, 2000, we had um, with Matthew Pinson, Steve Redgrave, James Cracknell, and Tim Foster. Matthew Pinson and James Cracknell like, continued on and won in Athens. So they're still 50% of the crew. Whereas if you, in the A, you need at least four of those guys to continue to, be, to have that same impact on the crew. So um, I think because of that, it, it does make it a harder boat to win consistently, that you need more people to continue on. And what tends to happen in rowing after a four-year cycle is you, you will naturally get people who want to retire or injuries, illnesses happen. There's just more variables, I think, within the eight than there are the smaller crews. Okay. In your athletic life, what was your darkest moment? Uh, I think in my athletic life, it was definitely uh, probably after London. Uh, in the build-up to London, I'd, I'd won the World Championship twice. Um, I, I definitely felt that I'd put myself as, personally as an athlete in the position to win the gold. And I think with it being a home game, it, was, uh, it just gave it that little bit extra. Um, you know, as, a, as an Olympian, like, the chance to, to go to Olympics is incredible. And, and to just do one is an incredible achievement. But you, you know that, yeah, you if you're good enough, you might have a chance to do multiple Olympics, but you'll never get a chance to do multiple home games. Like the chance that you'll only ever in your lifetime get a chance to do one home games. And I knew that going into London, that was kind of the big chance to win in front of home crowd. And at the age uh, I was, I was 29, I was kind of at the peak of, um, or kind of the start of the peak of my kind of physical career as a rower. Um, so I kind of felt it was really good opportunity to win from the home crowd. So yeah, to, to come away with the bronze and it was for me really disappointing. And it, it's hot. I have to always, for me, put this into context because people 
say, God, well, you, you got a bronze medal. That's incredible. How can you be disappointed? And I think a lot of people really struggle to understand how I can be disappointed with a bronze medal. But I think for us, we definitely went there um, with the sole aim of the gold. And for me, I got the, the, uh, the silver in Beijing for four years. I felt I'd done everything I needed to do. I'd been, I said I'd been world champion twice in that build-up. So I definitely went into London thinking I could win the gold medal. And to fall short of that, um, it was really disappointing. And it was really, it's kind of a hard pill to swallow. And it, d- it did take me quite a long time to get over. I didn't know whether I wanted to carry on and whether I wanted to do another games or whether I should retire. And I, yeah, I, I felt pretty lost for, for quite a while, probably a whole year afterwards. Um, I did feel pretty lost. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And I think, I think the thing as well, it's, it's, um, it's it's always hard and I think for me as well what I what I realized after London was that um I put so much emphasis on that result that uh when I was struggling with it afterwards I hadn't appreciated that that actually in that four years I'd had a really I'd really improved as an athlete and there were so many positives that had come out of that four-year cycle but because I hadn't because I hadn't won I just saw that whole period as negative Mm-hmm. Um, and I think definitely for me, it took me quite a long time to get my head around. Actually, that was a really good four years. It just didn't end as well as I want, as well as I wanted it to. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that, that was definitely for me. I think probably the, the hardest time in my rowing career. Yeah, and I've actually taken a note. I wanted to ask you later, but it fits perfectly here. I heard you talked on a podcast that you always wanted to be an Olympic gold medalist. So the London Games were your third Olympic Games and you had to go away without a gold medal. So did it spark um, to go even harder or did the dream, did you were afraid that the dream disappear? I mean, you kind of answered it somewhat, but... Yeah, it was, it was, it was um, as I said, for the, for the year afterwards, I mean, I mean, for me, it was all, it was all about winning. Um, and for me, I think you can step back and look at back at my career and actually look back at the bronze and the silver and be proud of them now. But at the time when you were in it, you're, I was very focused just on winning. That was, it wasn't, second wasn't good enough for me. And um, so to be, to have that disappointment of not winning uh, definitely was hard. And I, I said, I, I did feel really lost for the whole year afterwards, but I kind of, I didn't know really whether I wanted to carry on or uh, whether I should retire, but I did carry on because, um, just because I didn't really know what to do. Um, and I kind of found that for probably the next season, I was, I was training, but I was still a little bit going through the motions. Um, I think at that time in my career, I still, I still felt that because I hadn't achieved what I wanted to in London, that in some ways I'd, I'd wiped away the whole previous four years. Um, and I'd almost, for me, I, I didn't just see that year as disappointing. I'd almost seen that whole Olympic cycle as, as a disappointing period for me um, and I definitely that was my mindset for the whole four years so I think in my head even though I was training I was unwilling to fully commit to to another four years I was so I was I was, I was training and I was racing but I was very much going to the motions I was almost emotionally not 100% committed because I didn't want to risk the same thing to happen in four years time and I was almost giving myself this ready-made excuse that if it didn't work out the way I wanted to in Rio, then it'd be okay because I hadn't committed everything like I had done in London. Um, and then in 2013, I went to the World Championships. Um, we didn't perform particularly well. Um, and actually, this time, I wasn't in the eight. I was in the double, uh, which meant that I actually was on the side watching the eight race. Um, and that the eight went on to win the world championships, and it was obviously the boat I'd been in the year before, and they're there on the middle on the middle step of the podium, winning the gold medal, the gold medal I wanted to win. And I think for that, for me, that was that was kind of the, the light bulb moment where I actually went, okay, actually, no, I, that I, that is where I want to be. I don't want to be sat here going through the motions of of um, trying to protect myself um, emotionally of of not putting everything into it. Actually, I want to be where they are. I want to be. Were standing in the middle of the podium, getting that gold medal, and I realised then actually I had to be, I had to not be afraid of committing 100 percent and and not not be scared that it wouldn't it wouldn't come off because if I didn't go all in, it, it would never I'd never get that gold medal. Um, and I think the other thing I then realised that's actually that 
I was almost, I was so focused on the end result, I hadn't appreciated the journey. Uh, I hadn't appreciated that actually that four years in the build-up to London had been really good. I'd, I'd definitely improved as an athlete, I'd won world championships, I'd made some great friends, I had great experiences. Um, so it was silly to write off that whole time just on that one result at the end. Um, and if I was going to go and achieve what I wanted to achieve in Rio, I needed to really appreciate the result, the journey along the way a little bit more. So I think definitely that for me, the year after was when I changed that mindset and I kind of realized, yeah, okay, I really still do want to do want to win. And, but if I'm going to do it, I do need to be all in. I can't just, um, yeah, you, you have to take that risk that you have to commit yourself. Yeah, cool. What was your best moment? Uh, my best moment? I mean, <laughs> I think obviously winning the gold in Rio is, <laughs> is obviously an easy one. Um, but I'd still say for me, one of my proudest achievements in rowing was when I won the single um, as a junior. Uh, so I was 18. Um, I went to the Junior World Championships. So I'd, so I'd done the Junior World Champs the year before in the double. Um, and we'd come fourth. Uh, I think for me, I was so disappointed, but I had another year of doing juniors. So I was only 17 at the time. I had another year when I was 18. Um, so I kind of came, came away, went back to my club and me and my uh, club coach at the time, we, we set this goal. I said, okay, well, when I, when next year, when I go back to the World Championships, I want to win a single, uh, which at the time, no Brit had ever done. Uh, we'd never had a British athlete win the single. So it was quite a big, um, yeah, it was quite a big goal, uh, but it was something I was determined to do. And I think, for me, why well, that's probably one of the still my proudest moments is because I think once you get to the Olympics, it's it's great, it's a great achievement. But you are very much part of the big organisation. Um, obviously, you get so much support. You, I mean, we have coaches, we have strength and conditioning coaches, we have physiologists, nutritionists, psychologists. We have this great big team around us, and we're we're kind of the head of like the the head of the pyramid. But there's there's this great big base that helps us to get there. Whereas when I won the single, it was just me and my club coach. And then I actually had, I had another coach as well. Um, he kind of helped me out in the um, uh, as part, uh, team coach as well. But it was, it was a much smaller team. It was driven by me. Um, there wasn't all the funding. It, it was just kind of my, my target, my goal, my, my uh, thing that I had control of. Um, so I think when I then wanted to win it, that for me was really kind of a real great achievement in my career because it was something I felt I had control of, I had real ownership over. Whereas I think, yeah, by the time you get to the Olympics, you are just part of this much bigger picture. Mm. Um, that doesn't mean, obviously, yeah, of course, winning gold at the Olympics is still a, <laughs> it's an amazing feeling. But yeah, I think it's, yeah, I'd, I'd still say that the junior world champs is still up there as one of my kind of most proudest, proudest moments. Oh, really cool. If you could travel back in time, 10, 15, 20 years, what advice would you give a younger Matt? Uh, I don't have a big long list. Uh, <laughs> I think well, I, um, I mean, I, I think like obviously one of the things I've already touched on is I think I'd say to uh, tell myself to enjoy the journey a bit more. I think I definitely early on in my career, I was too fixated on the end result uh, and didn't appreciate the journey. Um, but I think also for me, I'd, I think definitely what I struggled with in my career was consistency in training. Um, I trained very hard. Um, I'd really push myself for two, three weeks, but inevitably I'd, I'd go too far and I'd push myself over the hill and get ill or injured. Um, and then it was a case of recovering from injury and then start again. So in terms of my training cycle, it was, it was very inconsistent. And I think later on in my career, probably only my last year, in the build-up to Rio, did I realize that, that yeah, the amount of training we do as athletes, um, and we always talk about giving it 100%, but sometimes that's not physically possible. And actually, we do so much training, you do have to sometimes pick sessions. Uh, sometimes sessions, you have to be happy that um, they're, not, they're not 100%. They are kind of um, a tick in the box, knowing that other times you will really target them. And I think that helps, I kind of, learn that to experience and it definitely helped me get more consistent in my training but sometimes training 100% of the program at 
maybe only 90% of the effort is better than training 80% of the program at 100% of the effort. Um, I think that definitely helped me to manage my training a little bit better. Um, and then the other thing I, I think for me is I probably, um, I'd probably tell myself to be a bit more patient. I think as an athlete, I was very, I knew I wanted to be and I knew how I wanted to row and, and I was always trying to be there the next session or the next day rather than uh, sometimes I think you need to be a bit more patient. It's, it's a bit of a more of a long game and it's your stepping stones rather than trying to already always try and reach your Olympic speed on you know, middle of middle of October, for instance. Okay. I heard you said you have been inspired by Stephen Redgrave at the 1996 Olympics as they won the only gold medal for GB at this Olympic Games. You must have been 13 at that time. Uh, why did it have such a profound impact on you? Um, I think for me it was uh, so when I was when I was younger, I just used to love sport. I um, swimming used to be my probably my main one, but I used to do every sport I could possibly um, do. I mean, I used to play rugby, football, tennis, athletics, any sport I could possibly do, I'd do. My parents are always having to drag me. Uh, I was always making my, uh, dragging my parents to take me to lots of different events. And I just really loved sport. Um, and then it was actually in, so it meant that when the Olympics were on, I, I would always be glued to that two weeks, um, suddenly watching the TV. Uh, as it was sport, my parents didn't mind the fact that I would pretty much uh, spend my entire evening just watching every, every event going. Um, I think my first real memory of the Olympics was 92. Um, when Linford Christie won the gold for Great Britain in the 100. But I think, um, so in 96, when that came around, at the time, the GB weren't as successful as we are now. Um, we were having a particularly bad games. I hadn't won any gold medals. Uh, I think we'd had a few silver and bronzes, but we hadn't had any golds. But the talk was all about the, our best chance for a gold medal with these two rowers, um, who at the time I hadn't, I hadn't really paid any attention to rowing. I'd never watched, watched the boat race. Um, but it made me, uh, because it was our best chance for a gold medal, it made me kind of uh, make an effort to make sure I watched the race. So I watched the race. Uh, after the race, um, which I obviously won, there was a lot of the, the talk and the commentary was all about how rowers were generally quite tall and they're quite big. And I was, as a, I mean, even as a 13 year old, I was quite tall, uh, certainly compared to the other 13 year olds that might, um, at the time and it kind of got me interested and I thought, okay, maybe this is a, maybe this is a sport I could be good at then. Um, so I then uh, started looking into it more and it turned out there was a rowing club five minutes from my house that I'd probably walked past like a hundred times because I used to walk the dog up and down the river. But until you see it on TV, you don't really notice it or you don't really take any interest in it. And then suddenly after having watched the Olympics, I took a bit more of an interest in it and yeah, I kind of made some inquiries and then went down and yeah, it all started from there really. Oh, cool. What are the habits that make you a successful athlete and person? Uh, I think it's, I think a lot of it is um, determination. Um, I think the thing with rowing is it's a, it, it's a sport that requires a lot of dedication. It's not, um, yes, you have to have natural talent, but you equally have to stick at it. It's not something that you immediately pick up and, and excelling. Uh, I think the first couple of times, well, first five times uh, for me in a rowing boat, I fell in. Um, so it was much more swimming to begin with than it was rowing. And fortunately, I was a good swimmer. But when it's the middle of October in the UK, it's it's not the most fun. <laughs> so um, yeah, so I think I think a lot of it is kind of determination. I think um, it's rowing is a difficult sport to describe because on. Uh, On a lot of sense of you um, describe as somebody, it doesn't sound like there's a lot of positives because it's you get up early, it's uh, you get cold, you get wet, you go backwards. Um, but I think so on paper you think, okay, well, why do I love this sport so much? And I think for me, what what kind of makes it is the fact that in order to do well at rowing at any level, you have to put the effort in. It takes a lot of hard work and determination. But so that in turn that means that when you do succeed at it and you do improve, whether it just be, I don't know, you get a better score on the row machine or you, um, or you win a race or whatever it is, it, it gives you that real sense of satisfaction because you've known how much effort you've put into it. 
So I think a lot of it is yeah, determination and resilience. Um, I don't, very few rowers will go through their entire career having, have never having any downs. And I think that's the thing is that uh, whether I've always been like this or whether it's taught me to be like this, I think it's made me a much more resilient person um, because of it. Like you do have downs, but it's yeah, the fact that you can pick yourself up and still have the determination and the drive to keep going. Um, and then the other, the other thing I'd probably say is I've always been very competitive. Um, anything I used to, I, I used to compete in anything I could, whether it be uh, card games or sports or anything. Anything I'd always, be, I'd always compete. So uh, for me, for me, it was very much about the racing. Um, some of the guys in the team love training, and they they love the. For me, though, I, the elements of training I loved was the competing and training. Um, if it was a race, then yeah, I was happy. But that, that was definitely why why I kind of did it. Cool. Yeah, also picking up on that point of determination and perseverance, I think that's what they say about rowing. It makes you tough, right? Because it's you, the boat, the water, at any weather, and you just have to do it. So you learn so much to overcome obstacles. Yeah, I think, yeah, you do, definitely. And in the racing as well, it's the same. Like you, you, you can often push yourself to places that you, you, didn't, you weren't quite sure you could go to. And um, yeah, you do. There's... there's some races you win easily, but some races you really have to uh, work and scrap for. Um, and then, yeah, you, you kind of definitely find more about yourself and yeah, you can, you come off the water generally um, feeling like you've achieved something. And yeah, you can, you can learn everything from, uh, you, you definitely learn a lot about yourself. Yeah. I heard you say something interesting on a podcast. I might butcher it a bit, but you said, as soon as you see your counterparts winning a gold medal, it's amazing how quickly your own expectations go up. Do you remember that? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So I think, um, I think that's the, one of the, uh, I mean, from my, from my time on the team, that the team has become, um, so my, my first games was Athens. Where um, so in Athens we only got one gold medal, uh, which was the four I mentioned with uh, Matthew Pinson and James Cracknell, um, and uh, Steve Williams and Ed Coote. So obviously it was only one gold medal from the team. But then by the time we got to Rio, obviously in the men's side we had um, the eight and the four win, but then we also had a, a women's pair. Um, so I think the team as a whole is and not uh, to. As well as that, we, uh, we've got a lot more medals as well. It's not just gold medals, it's also silver and bronze as well. Um, so as a team, we've massive, even over my career, we've massively uh, improved. And I think a lot of this, um, that quote I was saying is, it's success for success. Um, I think what, very much when I started on the team, um, I, so one of my idols was when I said about Steve Redgrave uh, winning the pair in 96, he was rowing with Matthew Pinson. Uh, so when I joined the team, Matthew was very much one of my idols and it was almost like you put them on this uh, pedestal and um, they were almost superhuman in a way and you were kind of fighting out for just to make the final and you almost put them at a level above you. Um, and I think it, at the time when you idolize, one of the dangers about idolizing someone is that you, uh, you don't think you can ever achieve, you, you put them on this pedestal and you don't, you kind of don't, you think what they can do is unachievable. Um, so it's only once one or two of us in the team started to match them in training. And suddenly one, once one or two of us did, then everybody else was like, well, hold on a minute, I used to be as good as that guy last year. So he can do it, I can do it. And it's amazing how quickly that snowballs. And uh, you suddenly see these guys who are actually that you've been competing with um, week in, week out. And they, and they are all matching the guys who you idolize. And you think, well, if they can do it, I can do it as well. And I think, yeah, it's, it's incredible. It shows you how much in sport uh, psychology plays into it and how much people set levels to themselves and don't appreciate uh, whether, how um, the kind of the heights they can achieve. Uh, because mentally they think they're at a level and that's the level they, they, can, they stay at and they train at and they compete at. But actually they're able to achieve so much more when, once they realize that uh, somebody else can do it, that they, they see as one of their counterparts. Mm. Um, so yeah, I think, I think for me it's kind of just shows how important psychology can be sometimes. Yeah, it's like this Roger Bannister story, right? And when he broke the four-minute mile, immediately after that so many people did it. Yeah, well, yeah. That's... It was believed that it's impossible to do. 
Yeah, no, I mean, it's a perfect example. I think, uh, I mean, it's, it, for me, I mean, you see in um, Beijing with Usain Bolt how, how far he is ahead when he wins the, uh, uh, in Beijing. And then in London, he, obviously he still wins by a long way, but he, he wins by a lot less. So everybody, it looks as if like he's not winning as quick, but actually his time in London was quicker than Beijing. And it makes you, uh, I think I like you, I'm sure. <laughs> I think it makes it you makes you realize that once somebody set a new level, everybody else increases to get up there. Um, I mean, he was so far from that. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned rowers have early mornings. Do you have a morning routine? I was dreadful at being early in the morning, uh, so I probably need to be careful because I'm sure a lot of my uh, fellow athletes will pull me up. I, I was, I never, I'm much better now actually since I've stopped rowing than I ever used to be. Uh, mornings definitely were not. I, I was definitely much of a night night owl rather than a morning person. So uh, yeah, I think I think for me it was very much of leave leave getting out of bed as late as possible, uh, grabbing a quick bite to eat as I uh, ran out the door to try and just make training on time. But it's probably not the uh, advisable way of doing it. I would definitely advise any kind of budding young athletes listening to uh, to set themselves a much better routine than what I had. Uh, and maybe that's actually something I would have said uh, if I was to go back and tell my younger self what I would do better. I'd definitely do the mornings better. I think uh, my my morning routine was particularly bad, and I could have, I probably could have done it a lot better than I did. But I don't know. you can't do everything right. <laughs> it is what it is, huh? Yeah. How do you prepare yourself for important moments? Um. So I think for us, one of the things. Um, I mean, if you're talking about like a big race or anything, one of the things we uh, we really do is we learn to develop routines. Um, I think as athletes, one of the uh, really powerful things you have, certainly when there's a lot of pressure, like there is at the Olympics, um, it there's a lot of um, you can take a lot of confidence from familiarity. So, um, like for the a big moment like the Olympics it's it's being worked on from uh, it's a four year period so almost every race uh, you're doing in the build up you're kind of developing a routine that you can use so that okay you might be in a completely different place but actually you can take the familiarity of the same routine and for me it's then about when I go into uh, the race day it's about kind of just doing the steps doing the processes that take me to the race um, so like for instance the first thing in the morning to go down have breakfast Uh, then it'll be go down and um, go out for um, uh, go out for our morning paddle, um, and then it's kind of it's so it's just step by step. It then be coming back to the hotel, and you develop this. I mean, I I even go as far as packing, making sure my bag the night before is packed the same way. Um, I always would like have a cut off point where I say, okay, well. Um, the preparation is done now. Okay, I need a couple of hours before I want to go to sleep to relax. Uh, and just almost watch a film, read a book, do anything I can not to think about the race because as far as I'm concerned, I've done all that thinking and, and it's, just, um, it's just going through this routine that you know is familiar, that okay, you might be a different place, different location, but it's tried and tested, it kind of, it works and you know, um, yeah, you know, you know, it's kind of, you can take comfort in the familiarity of it. You are a quadruple Olympian, meaning you went to four Olympic Games. Did the preparation change over the four Olympic cycles? And if yes, how? Um, I think uh, of the four games, probably um, the, the biggest thing was my attitude to it. Um, in terms of the preparation, the, the, uh, so definitely going into Athens, I think my biggest problem going to Athens was that Uh, really been my first games. I was only young. I was only 21. I, I really had in my head that you, that the only chance we'd ever have of competing at that level was if everything went perfectly. I really had in my head that in order to compete at the Olympics, you had to have this kind of perfect, perfect preparation. Like training needed to go really well. Everything had to be smooth. The boat had to be flying. Um, and in large ways, that's not reality. That you're going to have bad days. Um, And I think, uh, so, and which we obviously did in the build of to Athens. And I think because I was so focused on how, how we had to have this amazing build up, that actually because we had bad days and it wasn't going quite as well as we wanted it to, I almost, 
um, in the build up to Athens, it meant that when it hadn't gone that way, we weren't as confident as we, confident as we could be because, um, I mean, you, you can still go there and perform. You can still go there and compete and, and race because at the end of the day, the Olympics is no different to any other race. It's still 2,000 metre rowing lake. It's okay, it has this extra importance behind it, but the essence of the sport is the same. Uh, the water is not paved in gold like I had in my head. And, um, you know, it's, it's, still, it's still just a normal 2,000 metre rowing lake. You're still racing the same people you've been racing all year. Um, and it, but I think in my head, I've had this like, build up that we had to have this great preparation. And we just haven't had it. I mean, I've been injured. My doubles partner had been injured or ill. Um, and I think so after that, um, I guess when I went to Beijing, I was actually one of the guys in my boat in Beijing who kind of said to me, he's like, look, in order for us to win, we don't need to be perfect. We don't need to, we do, all we have to be is better than our opposition. And I think that for me, it struck a real note because that suddenly made it really achievable. Uh, and actually, you know that, yeah, when things aren't going your way or when you're not having great sessions, well, that's okay because the chances are that your opposition are doing the same. They're only human as well. They're only people. Um, and actually suddenly thinking, okay, well, all we've got to do is be better than them. It's such a more achievable goal than being perfect. I mean, even in Rio when we won, we didn't have a perfect race. We, the, we definitely could have done things better. We could have done better, things better in the preparation. Um, and I think, yeah, it's kind of my attitude and realizing that um, the more games you go to, what, what the games is and what you need to do to perform. Um, I think obviously the, the, the preparation for, um, I think the, the build up to Beijing was probably the smoothest uh, in terms of um, the Olympics I've been to. Uh, but then we, we just didn't quite perform as well as we could have done on the day. Um, I think in Rio, uh, we didn't have a completely smooth build up, but um, we had a very, for us, we were able to keep, a, we kept a lot of confidence because um, we were very determined that everything that didn't go our way was all big learning curves to make sure we got it right uh, on the day. Yeah. Um, so actually, any kind of negatives that we had, like we, we lost the first race of the season because... Uh, we got particularly bad conditions on the day, but actually we used that as a positive to make sure that if if we had the same things in Rio, we, wouldn't, we weren't going to be affected in the same way. Um, so yeah, whereas I think maybe in London, actually London was probably the worst preparation uh, that we had. And I think maybe that for me was because that when things didn't go away in the build-up, rather than seeing them as like we did in Rio as kind of real learning curves, we almost... We, uh, there was a bit of panic that we're not where we need to be and, and that kind of um, probably built. I don't think it was probably well, as well led as it could have been in terms of the, um, the preparation to build up to it. But um, I think, yeah, it's, uh, each game is different and yeah, different challenges. So just to, just to repeat, so in the build up to London, if something went wrong, you guys were kind of panicking. And in the build up to Rio, if something went wrong, you said, what can we learn from that? Yeah, I think it's just a different attitude. I mean, so the coaching was definitely different. And um, so one of the things we had with, um, uh, so in Rio, in Rio, we had Jürgen, um, Jürgen Grobler, who was our, um, who was also, was the chief coach. Uh, Jürgen, who's just actually retired, but he's, Incredibly successful coach, has won numerous gold medals. So he won the gold medals with uh, Stephen Matthew. Um, and he has been, yeah, kind of, I think he's obviously been there, done it before. So I think for, um, for us, as a crew, he gave us a lot of confidence. That, and he was able to kind of draw on that confidence that he had from previous games to say that, okay, look, if... Um, It doesn't matter if we haven't won this race. The only race that's important to win is the final of the Olympics. Even if we didn't win the heats, the only race we actually have to win is the Olympic final. So everything we do has to make sure that we win that race. Um, so it, when we didn't win the early races, it was okay, look, okay, that's fine. Okay, it's not ideal. We, we want to be winning now, but we don't need to be. So there's a lot, there's a lot, more, um, there's a lot more calm within the team because we kind of saw every opportunity as a, as a way of, of learning to make sure we won that final race. Uh, whereas I think in London, quite conscious to that, it was 
the um, the attitude was a lot more like, okay, we need to be winning this race. Okay, we're not quick enough. We need to win the next race. Okay, we're not quick enough. We need to win the rec- next race. And there wasn't that kind of calm of, okay, look, okay, it doesn't matter. We're not where we need to be right now as long as we're where we need to be at the end. I think it was much more of a panic like, okay, well, we haven't won this race. We're, we're not there yet. Well, we've got to make sure we're in the next race. And I think that kind of, it was a, it was a very different attitude and uh, there was um, a different approach to it which I, I think was probably detrimental to the London crew and positive to the real crew I think so yeah it's interesting what you said about just winning the final race is important I had someone from the 2000 Olympic Games from the men's rowing eight from GB and he said exactly the same thing yeah well I think ultimately you can uh, you can be Olympic champion and never and only win one race in your entire life uh, which is the crazy thing about it but I think, yeah, it is. You, I mean, you can, you can have won every single race in the build-up to the Games, but if you don't win the, uh, the final one, then somebody else gets crowned Olympic champion. Yeah. Um, it's all of, and I think in some ways that's what makes the Olympics so special because it's, it's that one chance in four years. It's not one chance every, every year or every couple of months, or it's that one chance every four years. And I think, um, yeah, I think it's... Um, It, what, it's what makes it it's so special. So uh, definitely. How do you overcome setbacks? Um, I don't think there is a. Uh, I don't think there is a, a secret formula to it. I think for me, I've always been very lucky that. I mean, I. Um, I think, like like I said earlier, I'm, I'm very competitive. I think I was. I was always been very focused on winning. Um, so I'm probably not the best loser. Uh, I think, um, I mean, again, I think saying you get a bronze and silver medal, call it a loser is, a, is the wrong phrase. But I think like it's, um, I said it for me, because I was so focused on the gold medal, uh, I, I sometimes did, yeah, I, I, I struggled to see anything but the gold medal as, as a victory. Um, but I think, I think for me, I've always had a very supportive family. I've got very supportive friends and, I mean, in some ways, I think that they um, they struggled and they got frustrated with me at times because uh, when I came back from Beijing and, Lund- and London, I'm disappointed with these gold medals. They, they uh, sorry, these these silver bronze medals. They they couldn't quite appreciate or understand. I think they could for me, but obviously for them, they saw it as a great achievement. They, they could understand because they understand me, but I think for them, they were they actually struggled because they're like, look, you should be you should be really proud of this. Um, But I think a lot of it is, um, I mean, some things are easier to get over than others. Obviously, a lot of it depends on the importance of the events. Um, I think at World Championships, it's disappointing um, or a smaller race, but then you know that you've got another chance in a year. Um, again, if it's just a World Cup, you might have another chance in a, in a couple of months uh, or three weeks' time. Um, but I think the Olympics, obviously, it's you know that you might never get another chance or if you do it'll be in four years time so obviously it, i think a lot of it depends on the on the event and and um the importance of it but i think i think i think for me a lot of it was just looking at what where i felt i could be better um, and where i felt i could improve and i think for me ultimately although i I wanted to be Olympic champion. What I actually really wanted was to be the very best I could be. I just wanted to feel like I really was the best athlete, best rower I could possibly be. That was ultimately my, always my ultimate goal. Um, and I think so a lot of it was kind of, and I think if I, if I'd have, if I'd have achieved that and have got the bronze medal, then I'd have probably said, okay, well, this is as good as I can be. And this is actually something I've achieved as much as I can achieve. But I think because I hadn't, I always felt there was things I could improve on. As far as I was concerned, I could always get better. So although it might be disappointing, um, for me, it was never the end of the road because there was, always play, there was always ways I could improve and get better. And I think for me, definitely after London, uh, which was my biggest setback, uh, it wasn't so much physically, it was much more my attitude and my mental approach to it. Um, I think in terms of the way I approach training and in terms of the way I enjoyed the sport and and uh, wasn't so fixated just on the results actually enjoyed enjoyed the training enjoyed being part of the team enjoyed the because uh, I think definitely um, 
you sometimes when you're so focused on the result you you can lose that sometimes and it's important to remember actually you're doing it because it's fun and that's the reason you started in the first place so I think that was the thing for me it was always as long as there was something I could improve and something I could do better that was always my way of getting over setbacks I knew okay maybe at this point I might not be where I want to be right now but actually I, I, I still stuff I can improve to get there Who's your role model and why? It's my role model. Um, oh, that's a difficult one. Uh, do you mean in a sporting sense or in life or? Whatever comes to mind. Uh, I think definitely when I was growing up, it was definitely my granddad. Um, I mean, my granddad was always, yeah, kind of the, the person I always looked up to. Um, he was a massive supporter of my rowing. Um, and yeah, I think, I think my granddad, he was just always a very calm, um, he was a man of few words, but when, when he said something, it, it always seemed to be right and always seemed to be relevant. And yeah, I think definitely for me that he was a big influence. And um, I think, yeah, that's probably the person I'd, Uh, he immediately spring to mind. Cool. What is the best advice you received and who gave it to you? Uh, I think actually probably the best, the best advice I received was uh, from uh, Tom in my eight in the build-up to Beijing. Um, as I said, we talked about earlier, I think in the build-up to Athens, I had this fixation on how everything had to be perfect. And, um, and I think actually just... I know it sounds simple, but actually, yeah, just that kind of advice, it really stuck with me because suddenly, as I said, it, it made this whole uh, thing so much more achievable. And it, it meant almost that um, that I could uh, almost relax a little bit more and kind of uh, not lose faith when things didn't go quite as well as we wanted it to, because I knew actually that was going to be the same for my position as well. And I think once you, one of the big things for me is, is realizing that um, everybody's very the same. I mean, I think, um, I mean, for example, when I was an athlete growing up, I used to get particularly, I used to get really nervous before race. Um, and so when I joined the senior team, obviously I was probably the youngest in the team. And uh, I remember I'd, I'd look at the older guys. I'd look at Matthew Pinson when he was still racing. And he just looked, before a race, he just looked so relaxed. He, he pretty much looked like he was asleep. Uh, whereas I would almost be churning inside and feeling like I was going to be sick and, and uh, have all these nerves. And I think, oh, God, why, why can I not just be as relaxed as he is? And, and just um, maybe, maybe I'm not cut out for this or whatever. And... And then we did this, uh, he, just before Athens, because he was the senior member of the team, he was going for his fourth gold medal. Uh, he did his chat to the rest of the, to the younger athletes. And one of the things he talked about was how before every big race, he used to be sick over the side of the boat. Uh, and that for me was like, oh, wow. Well, if he feels that way, then actually it's okay for me to be like this. Um, and yeah, it's this, um, Yeah, it's kind of this is sudden appreciation. Actually, everybody is the same. Everyone goes through the same feelings, the same. Um, everyone's just human. Like, I think sometimes uh, in big competitions, you, as I said, you can almost uh, build it up too big to, to be something bigger it is. And you can think your opposition uh, kind of almost don't feel pain, but they go through the exact same thing you do. And, and yeah, I think, I think for me, once I realized that actually what I was feeling was completely normal, it definitely helped me to deal and cope with my nerves a lot better and, and actually brace them. Uh, I realized now, I think by the end of my career, I realized that's actually something that I really need and actually enjoy. I enjoy that kind of feeling and, of, yeah, because I, I know that get, gets the best out of me. Um, I think for me as, a, uh, as an athlete, I was very much an athlete that could um, perform on the big stage, I think, Uh, in, I performed better in a race than I do in training uh, not because I didn't try hard in training just because I think having that competitiveness having that nerves having that adrenaline going really kind of brought the best out of me um, so yeah I kind of thrived on it rather than uh, feared it by the end mm -hmm, cool how did the typical training day in an Olympic rowers life look like? long tiring <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think so we used to uh, so it's generally 
two to three sessions a day. Um, mostly always top stand. So a normal day, we'd start probably about half seven in the gym. Um, so we'd start off with weights, um, do weights from about half seven till about half nine. Um, then we'd have a bit of a break. Uh, we'd, have, we'd go on our, what would actually be our second breakfast because we'd usually have a small breakfast before we did our weights. Uh, so we'd go and have a second breakfast um, probably from, we'd get on the water about 11 o'clock uh, where we'd go and do 20 kilometers roughly. It's usually a pretty standard session for rowers. Um, then we'd finish, we'd have another break um, and then we'd probably start our final session of the day which usually be either back on the water for another 20, 16 kilometer row or on the row machines uh, for a similar distance. Uh, rowing tends to be, you do a lot of mileage in rowing. Um, so it's all about uh, building a big base um, and the kind of steady long mileage. It was like, it's almost like going for a steady jog um, is our kind of base training. And then as we get closer to a race, then we do shorter sessions, but a lot sharper uh, a bit more kind of towards what we're going to do in race racing, but uh, the main the main kind of um, types of training we do are weight training on the in the boats and on the row machines. Uh, occasionally, uh, we did a in, in January we go away to South Africa where we do a cycling camp. Um, before that, we used to go to uh, Sam Ritz in Switzerland and do a cross country skiing camp, but. I think uh, Jürgen realised that none of us could ski very well, so we did that for we did that for, we did that for five six years, and eventually changed to cycling instead. So, okay. And I listened to a podcast where you said you enjoyed the training camps in uh, Sierra Nevada. <laughs> oh God! <yeah. laughs> But in these training camps, were there only rowing on the ergometer, nothing on the water? Yeah, yeah. So, the, so, so Sierra Nevada, for people who don't know, is it can only be described as a huge leisure center on top of a mountain. Um, so it's where the, the Spanish built it for the 92 Olympics. And it's this big training complex, uh, but it doesn't have a rowing lake there. So we would go for two and a half weeks. And that would be by far our toughest camp of the year. So it's at high altitude. So I think it's at 2,300 meters. Um, so obviously the oxygen is quite thin, uh, but we'd be on the row machines all day. So you're, you're doing 20 kilometer rows, just looking at a little screen. Uh, I mean, if you, if you're lucky enough to be able to put it by a window, you might get a bit of a view, but, um, that quickly, um, yeah, yeah the, the view quickly fades into the background when you're, uh, you're, you're struggling to breathe and you're tired. So we, that, I mean, that would be a really hard training camp. We do probably four sessions a day. So we tend to do at least maybe two rows on the row machine, uh, do weights, sometimes two weight sessions a day, and then maybe do football or swimming in the evenings. Uh, but that, that was a real training camp to push us. But the, the hardest sessions I remember there was um, always the early morning ergo sessions. They were the real dreaded ones. Like your, your body's not awake is it anyway. Um, and then obviously the air is so thin, it just feels like you're... Uh, you, you're trying to train, but breathing through a straw. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's very much survival. If you can survive the camp, then that's like, uh, you do get a great feeling of satisfaction coming back down the mountain, knowing that you survived the two weeks, but I don't think anybody looked forward to it. I don't think anyone really enjoyed it. It was, it was, it was very much survival. And uh, some people cope better with altitude than others. I think I didn't cope that well. I think uh, my physiology didn't particularly like altitude, but uh Yeah, it's, I don't think anyone enjoys it. It's a pretty miserable camp. <laughs> <laughs> cool. You help people nowadays with the experiences you gained as an athlete through coaching and speaking. What are you doing? Uh, so, since I've, um, so since I've retired, I've, uh, so my main thing that I'm doing is I've been working towards my uh, commercial pilot's license. Uh, so I've been training as a, as a pilot. Um, Unfortunately, it's been a little bit delayed for various reasons, some my own, some not. Um, I initially, I broke my leg, which delayed me starting my training uh, by a year. Uh, but then obviously now with uh, just coming towards the end of my course and uh, COVID has hit, so uh, that's delayed me a little bit. But I thank thankfully am now back flying now and hopefully should finish in the next six, six weeks. 
Um, so yeah, that's been my big thing I've been working towards. But on the side, I do yeah been doing some speaking uh, and some coaching as well. Uh, so I've done a bit of coaching, but also yeah some kind of motivational public speaking, trying to share my stories and um, hopefully passing on what the things I've learned as an athlete. And yeah, it's been. Um, uh, but yeah, the main main thing has been trying to kind of get my pilot's license and um, yeah start, start a new career in, in aviation. And in our pre-interview chat, you mentioned that you learned a lot of things as an athlete, not being necessarily aware of it, but you realize it now in your quote-unquote normal post-athletic life. What are these things you learned? Uh, I think, a, a, yeah, I think for me it's been, um, I think certainly when you're an athlete and you definitely you come to the end of it and you... Um, you kind of come to a time and you, you step away from sport and you just think, okay, I've, I've been rowing for me. I've been rowing for 16 years and you think, oh, that's all I am. I'm a rower and that's all I'm really qualified to do. But what you don't realize is actually sport, I think is a, a great way of teaching you lots of transferable skills that you don't, you don't really realize you're picking up. And I think for me, having gone into aviation and there's been a, um, I mean, for example, like the testing process is, um, uh, so the selection process initially is quite rigorous so the fact that I've learned how to kind of cope and deal with pressure and um, I remember actually uh, speaking earlier about routine is actually what I used for my selection day I, I kind of sat down and said okay how can I make sure that when I go for my selection day I perform to the best of my ability and um, so what I did was I, I obviously practiced and I, um, I mean, even like the interviews I, I got my um, my girlfriend to interview me and and uh, do a mock interview and I did mock assessments and mock team building and then I practiced doing and I went through a whole routine of the day of putting on the same the same thing I was going to wear in the morning of the day and just developed this routine and that was kind of a, something I realized in rowing that I'd um, been learning this this way and these kind of skills of coping with pressure uh, and then on top of that then once I'd started the course um, you do six months of ground school, which is a really demanding uh, period where you obviously have to, um, it's, it's very much kind of you're in class all day and then you're all evening and weekend studying. Um, but for me, I think so. some of the other cadets uh, maybe struggle with that, the fact that the discipline and sacrifice of having to give up your weekends. But again, for me, I just kind of fell back into that rowing mentality of, okay, well, I've got this goal that I want to work towards and this is what I have to do to achieve it. And, is that discipline of being able to do it. So actually for me, I found it kind of straightforward because uh, they're all things I'd learned as an athlete and um, I was able to draw upon to, to kind of really help me in, in, in this new career. And it, it's amazing actually once, it's only once I've started that I've realized that, yeah, that there have been all these skills that you think are just sports related, but are general life related um, that you can use and draw upon. Really cool. Where can people find you? Uh, well, I do have a website, uh, which is uh, www.mattlanguage.co.uk, or um, I am on LinkedIn as well. Um, I have an Instagram, which social media has never been my uh, real forte. I'm, I'm not great on social media, but I do have a social, uh, Instagram and uh, Twitter as well. Um, so yeah, they can also uh, find me on there. But um, unfortunately, my posts aren't very often, so I don't think I have the most exciting social media account. I am determined at some point to get better. I'm, I'm slowly getting better at Instagram uh, now that I'm flying again and thinking, getting a few more interesting things I can post. Uh, I, I've started to try and post again, so yeah, you can follow me on that. Really cool. Matt, thanks a lot for your time. Yes, awesome. Thank you very much. It's really nice to meet you.